Good evening and welcome everyone uh, to another episode of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Christina Hagen, coming to you live from Cape Town. Now, before I start uh, the webinar and, and the usual announcements, um, we wanted to talk about the uh, ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and that's impacting South Africa and our people. I'm sure all of you, we all know that someone who's been ill or has passed away, um, sadly, one such person uh, who will be familiar to most South African birders is Joe Grossel. We were deeply saddened uh, by the passing of Joe on Saturday. While I unfortunately never got the chance to meet him or go birding with him, I've read uh, a lot of the tributes that have come pouring in uh, for him and his love for nature shone through them all. Joe's recent Conservation Conversations pre uh, presentation on birds and birding at Mafungubwe was one of our most, uh, one, one of the, the best attended webinars. Joe spoke with authority and enthusiasm, and he ex exuded a passion and a love for birds. Our CEO, Mark Anderson, uh, had this to say. Joe did so much for birds and birding, especially through his lectures and courses. Uh, in fact, few have done as much. Joe was admired and loved by everyone who met him, including the community bird guides he assisted uh, or he trained and engaged with. Joe's passing is a massive loss to the cause, which is so important to BirdLife South Africa. So we would like to extend, um, as a BirdLife South Africa team, we'd like to extend our sincerest and deepest condolences to Joe's wife, Lisa, and to his friends and family. And we also wanted to take this moment to remember the many others who have died or are fighting this disease. Please do everything that you can to stay safe and healthy at this time. So on to tonight's uh, webinar, our speaker, Dr. Anina Kutsia, will be sharing her research on sunbird ecology. But before I introduce her, please remember that you, our audience, can communicate with us uh, using the Zoom chat room, um, and questions for Anina can be posted in the in the Q and A box throughout the webinar. If you are watching us on Facebook Live, you can use the comment feed for your comments and questions, and we'll answer these at the end of the webinar. If you would like to get in touch via our social media channels, please use the hashtag Conservation Conversations. All of our previous episodes are available on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel. And uh, we'd like to ask you to subscribe to the YouTube channel to help us grow support for our video content. Um, many of you will know that we um, had previously had a, um, a podcast um, of, the, of the webinars, uh, but we have actually decided to discontinue this um, as there are costs associated with producing it, and the listener numbers, unfortunately, did not justify that. So if you're enjoying this webinar series and can afford to support it financially, um, every little bit helps to keep this webinar free for all to learn and enjoy. Um, you can simply scan the Cricut QR code on the screen or visit the Conservation Conversations website to find a link uh, to the donations tab. And we'd like to say a big thank you to everyone, everyone who's donated so far. Now, there are only about 70 tickets left in our jackpot birding raffle. Uh, so you must make sure not to miss out on this opportunity to support conservation while standing a pretty good chance of winning 100,000 rand. You can head over to birdlife.org.za slash jackpot dash birding. And I'll put that link in, in the chat box. We are also still running our Conservation League donor competition. Um, and that is ending at the end of August. You can show your commitment to conservation by signing up and standing a chance to win a four-night stay for two at Zimanga Private Game Reserve in northern KwaZulu-Natal, KwaZulu valued at 40,000 rand. For more information, please email membership at birdlife.org.za. And now it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Anina Kutsia to our Conservation Conversations webinar series. Anina is a lecturer in nature, nature conservation at the um, Nelson Mandela University George campus. She has a PhD in ecology from Stellenbosch University, where she also completed her BSc honors. 
Uh, thereafter, she was a postdoctoral research fellow at the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology at the University of Cape Town, studying bird pollination systems. Her research interests include Feinbos conservation biology, plant animal mutualisms, and community ecology. So Anina uh, pre-recorded this uh, webinar, so I will just uh, start that presentation now. In this talk on sunbirds and flower color, I will be discussing the wonders of sunbird vision and how this is influencing flower color. Sunbirds are these beautiful, busy little birds. They typically weigh only 10 grams. There are about 14 species in South Africa, but I will be focusing mostly on the species that occur in the Cape, and in particular, the orange-breasted sunbird, which is the male, species, male of the species that you see in the photo here. The orange-breasted sunbird is endemic to the Feinbos biome. Now, this biome is a type of vegetation or a habitat type which occurs in an area which we call the Cape Floristic Region. And as you can see on the map here of Southern Africa, this region is shown in green here. It, the region basically covers the Western Cape and going up to the Cedarburg area, and then it stretches east along the coast and the uh, first mountain ranges all the way to um, the Eastern Cape. So not a very large region and unfortunately not very famous for its bird diversity, but in fact famous for its plant diversity. Now currently the orange-breasted sunbird is classified as least con concern in terms of its conservation status, so it is not threatened with extinction. However, as you can see, the species is restricted to a relatively small area. And because it's a specialist of this famous um, type, a habitat type, um, it is adapted to this area and it cannot, uh, or it's very unlikely that it can adapt to other habitat types. Therefore, it's very reliant on this. And um, I'm sure you can imagine that if this habitat type was to be degraded or destroyed by um, human expansion or by climate change and um, changing the conditions then there's um, much less habitat available for the species and they do not have anywhere else to go so they are quite sensitive in that respect and therefore this um, famous habitat type is very important to them so these orange-breasted sunbirds weigh around 10 grams and their bill length is around 20 milliliter, millimeters long. Another bird species that is also endemic to the Feinbos biome is the Cape sugarbird. Um, there are only two sugarbird species in the world, and one is this Cape sugarbird that occurs in the Cape, and the other is the Gurney sugarbird, which occurs in the Dragonsburg region. This species is also a nectar drinking specialist bird, just like the sunbirds. And you can see that they have a very similar body shape and bill shape to the sunbirds. However, they are much larger, weighing around 30 to 40 grams. And their bill length is also significantly longer, being around 30 millimeters compared to the sunbird with its 20 millimeter bill length. Another difference is the feathers. As you can see, the sunbird is not as brightly colored. Um, and in the photo here is a female sugarbird, which you can see the tail is quite long, um, but in the males, they are even longer. Another nectar drinking specialist bird species that occurs in the Feinbos area is the Malachite sunbird. The males of these species are entirely green and they um, have a, a couple of elongated or extra long tail feathers, at least during the breeding season, whereas the females are a more drab, olive greyish color. And they're, although they occur in the Feinbos, their range extends into the Northern Cape, the Eastern Cape, a part of Free State and into Gauteng as well. So they are not 
um, endemic or, or limited to the famous area. Now, you may have noticed that their bill seems a bit extra long, and indeed it is. These malachite sunbirds weigh between 50 and 20 grams, so they are a bit heavier than the orange-breasted sunbirds, um, but their bill length is around 30 milli millimeters long, which is the same as the sugarbird, which is still another 10 grams heavier than these birds. So they do have a, a super long bill for their size, um, and this has uh, enabled them to carve a specialized uh, feeding niche in the, uh, the ecosystems where they occur in. But I'll get back to that a bit later. And then there are the southern double collared sunbirds. They also occur in the Fainbos, but their range also extends into the Northern Cape, Free State and Eastern Cape. And similar to the other sunbird species, the males are very colorful and the females and the juveniles have uh, much more drab colors. Um, and many of the sunbirds, similar to this male here, have iridescent feathers, which is this structural component of the feathers that help to contribute um, to shape the color. And it um, makes the color change a bit depending on the direction from which one is viewing the feathers. Um, so in this case, this male has green iridescent feathers and blue iridescent band here, while the red feathers are not iridescent. These sunbirds are a little bit smaller than the orange-breasted sunbirds, weighing around 8 grams, and uh, their bird length is also a bit shorter, around 19 millimeters. Now, while most of us, I'm sure, know sunbirds for their colorfulness, this talk will not be focusing on what sunbirds look like, but actually how they see the world. Sunbirds are often confused with hummingbirds. Both of these groups of birds are small, they're active little birds, and they're very colorful. They're both colorful um, groups. And of course, both of them have these long, slender bills. And that is because they both specialize on feeding on nectar. Um, however, these sunbirds and hummingbirds are not closely related at all. And these similarities that they share are just because of the similarity in their ecology. Sunbirds um, are, occur primarily in Africa, although there are a few species in Asia and um, Australia while the hummingbirds are restricted to North and South America, and there is a greater diversity of species there. So, of course, the easiest way to determine whether you're looking at a sunbird or hummingbird is to ask yourself what continent you are on. But you can also tell the difference um, in some of other aspects, and uh, most notably is their size. The hummingbirds are mostly smaller than the sunbirds. Um, and they are very, very small, sometimes even confused for large insects. And this small size allows them to hover um, a, a lot, actually. Um, and they hover while they are feeding on flowers, as you can see in this image here. Um, and sunbirds, being larger, do not hover that much. And they prefer to perch while they are um, feeding. So they sit on a branch or a leaf or... Uh, the flowers itself. And so you'll notice that the bird pollinated flowers uh, or flowering plants in South Africa usually have a nice sturdy branch or a sturdy plant pot that allows the sunbirds to perch, perch nicely while they drink from the flowers. And one of the things that sunbirds are looking at the most frequently is flowers. These rather odd, long, slender bills of them are specializations for drinking nectar from long tubular flowers like these. They also have tubular tongues and effective sucrose digestion to help them specialize on drinking nectar, which is essentially just a sugar, sugar solution. So because of their fast metabolism, they have to drink nectar very regularly. 
and an individual can drink up to three times its own weight of nectar in a day. So they are very reliant on nectar. So when these birds probe their bill into flowers to get to the nectar, a yellow powder is dusted onto them. And this is in fact the pollen of the flowers, which contain the male reproductive cells of the plants. So when a sunbird visits one flower, it picks up pollen. And when it visits the next flower, it will rub off pollen onto that flower and that pollen can fertilize the eggs and produce seeds. And these seeds can of course grow into new plants. So these flowers are actually using the birds to move their pollen between plants. The foraging path of that sunbird determines how pollen is mixed between plants, but the birds do not care about their pollination duties. They just want food. Therefore, flowers must reward the birds, and most bird-pollinated plant species reward them with nectar. But nectar is a transparent liquid inside the flower tubes, which is not visible from a distance. So the reward must be advertised, and one of the most obvious adverts is their flower color. So how do sunbirds see color? Well, firstly, we must consider that birds have much more complex visual systems and vision than humans. So we cannot assume that the way we see things is the way that they see it. Um, humans, insects and birds have different amounts of um, pigments in their eyes, which pick up color or light reflectance. And these diagrams here illustrate um, more or less the types of colors that our eyes can pick up. In this uh, top diagram here, um, human vision is illustrated and humans have three pigments in their eyes that pick up color um, and they have different sensitivities. So our pigments are, are best at absorbing uh, purplish blue, uh, blue colors, green colors and yellowish colors. Um, but the pigments pick up these colors and then the brain interprets and combines that information and then translates it to a color um, that you understand or that, that you then perceive as, as a certain type of color. So this is human vision. Uh, many of the insects illustrated in this middle diagram here also have three of these color pigments in their eyes, but theirs differ from ours. Um, and usually one of their pigments is here in this range, which we call the UV or ultraviolet range of light. So many of them can see UV reflectance. Um, however, the, this peak is also shifted to the left, as you can see. So many of them cannot see red colors very well. Um, and it's actually difficult for them to distinguish red and greenish colors. Now birds, on the other hand, have four of these pigments that absorb light and um, interpret color. So some of the birds can see into the UV range, but what's interesting about them is that this uh, one pigment of them is shifted a bit to the right compared to humans and insects. So they are better at um, perceiving and distinguishing red colors. Um, and some believe that they are very good at identifying and distinguishing red colors. It stands out very much to them. Tetrahedrons can help us to model bird vision. A tetrahedron has three triangles as you, um, on the upper side and one triangle at the bottom. And in this bottom flat triangle, you can see a representation of the color space that humans can see. Now birds can see all of these colors plus all the other colors that fills this 3D space. So we can almost say that they see colors in more dimensions than we do. Now scientists believe that birds' vision has contributed to creating flower colors over evolutionary time. Now, there are, of course, many bird species, and they do not all have the same visual capabilities. 
we refer to these visual capabilities as their visual system. And there are two broad categories of visual systems in birds. Firstly, there are those birds that have ultraviolet sensitive visual systems and they can see into the UV range. Then there are the birds with violet sensitive visual systems that um, do not see UV. Now studies that have looked at the genes in birds that control their visual function suggest that some birds have uh, UV sensitive visual systems allowing them to see UV colors as well. And they suggest that, that hummingbirds do not. Uh, this would be quite a um, important difference between these two ecologically functional groups. However, recent experiments suggest that um, hummingbirds can actually perceive in the UV range. Um, so they might be UV sensitive. And this is a field in which we will definitely still uh, need much more experiments um, and learn more about distinguishing and understanding these birds' vision. But what is clear is that uh, it's very likely that these birds' visual systems and how they see colors have affected the other organisms and species that they interact with. And so we believe that they have affected uh, flower color evolution. Erica Plucanetti is potentially a good example of how bird vision can influence flower color. This Erica species have uh, different flower colors in different areas. So in some areas, the flowers are pink, pink, different shades of pink. And in others, they are whitish colors. So birds um, are quite good at distinguishing red and different shades of reddish colors because of their um, great sensitivity of one of their pigments in the red range. While insects very typically struggle to distinguish reddish colors from um, green colors because red and green are relatively similar to them. So um, it may be that these uh, pink reddish ericas are more visible to birds than to insects. And indeed, the researchers that studied the species found that the populations um, or the areas where the ericas have pink flowers, the flowers are pollinated by sunbirds. The other areas where these flowers are white, the flowers are pollinated by this nocturnal moth. Um, and therefore, it seems as though the vision of the moth um, has driven these ericas to evolve a white color, whereas the um, sunbirds select pink colors. Um, so this is potentially an example of how different vision, visual systems can drive uh, different flower colors in species. The Erica plants provide a very nice system to test questions about sunbirds' vision. The group is unusually diverse, with almost 700 species occurring in the Cape Floristic region alone. Of these, 67 species have been classified as bird pollinated, and they typically have larger flowers that are of, have long tubular shapes compared to these insect pollinated species that are smaller and have bell shapes. These bird pollinated Erica species come in a great variety of colors and many of them can have multiple colors within the same species. And here are some examples, Erica viscaria and Erica mimosa, which displays these different colors in different areas and Erica coccinea, which is one of the wide-ranging species of Erica, have, seen, have colors that range from lime green, yellow, orangey to reddish. And Erica grandiflora has uh, two subspecies, one that's quite range restricted and that have yellow flowers, and the other one that's a bit more widespread that have uh, red flowers that can also sometimes have uh, orange in them.
The interesting thing is that this great diversity of ericas is almost exclusively pollinated by the orange-breasted sunbird. This, might, this is probably partly because of the body size differences in the nectar-drinking birds. The orange-breasted sunbird is around, weighs around 10 grams, whereas the Cape sugarbird weighs almost three or four times as much. And therefore, they prefer to feed from these um, large flower heads from proteas and pincushions and pagoda bushes, which can hold a lot more nectar. The malachite sunbird is only slightly larger than the orange-breasted sunbird, but it has a much longer bill, and so it prefers to feed from flowers with very long tubes because they can also contain more nectar. The southern double-collared sunbird is a very similar size to the orange-breasted sunbird, but it is not a fainbow specialist, and therefore it is mostly much less common in fainbow's areas than the orange-breasted sunbird, which is where these ericas occur. So we asked whether this diversity of flower colors in erica is because the orange-breasted sunbird has no flower color preferences. We used Erica perspicua in this experiment because it has two color forms, white and pink, that are very similar in all other aspect, aspects besides color. The pink and the white flowering plants uh, grow and flower together right next to each other. And, so, and this nectar is also very similar. So if the birds do visit one color more than the other, then it is because of a color preference and not other preferences. Our experiments showed that the birds preferred pink flowers because they mostly visited them and 88% of their first visits were to pink flowers and not white ones. And this was true for males, females and juvenile birds. So that made us wonder how these erica species are surviving together because they often co-occur. If the sunbirds have color preferences, does that cause similar colored erica species to occur together? As you can see in this image here with the two greenish erica species flowering together. So we looked at 10 sites where multiple erica species occur together. Um, and just to orientate you, this is South Africa here, and there is the little southwestern corner where this work was done. And I sampled these 10 sites from the Cape Point on the Cape Peninsula, Table Mountain, Pearl, Somerset West, Pringle Bay, all the way to Hermanus. And what a privilege to work in these beautiful sites. So looking at the ericas that occur together, we found that indeed many of the erica species that grow and flower together have similar flower colors. For example, here at, uh, in the Cape Peninsula at Cape Point, Erica coccinia and Erica mimosa both have these um, yellow greenish colors. And at um, Tafelberg Road, Erica abatina and Erica plucanetti both have pinkish colors. So, um, but the color similarity is not uh, the only thing that's important, but also how many visits they get from sunbirds. So we also quantified um, which of these flowers get the most visits from sunbirds. One of the fun things about ericas is that you can tell whether a sunbird has visited a flower without actually observing the sunbird. When the flowers have not been visited yet, their anthers, which are the brown structures here, are very tightly around the stigma, the female part, and it remains that way until a sunbird probes it its bill into the flower tube here and it breaks up this ring of anthers in the erica so you can clearly see this disruption which indicates that a sunbird has visited it. So what we saw when we looked at their sunbird visitation rates we see that the uh, species with the same flower colors um, seem to get more visits by sunbirds. But the interesting thing is that not all species benefited from this color similarity. 
Um, this, they seem to be one species, in this example here, the Erica abetina, that is very preferred by the sunbirds and they get a lot of visits. Then there are other species that seem to mimic or copy the color of this preferred species so that they can also attract the attention of sunbirds and get lots of visits. And if there was another species at the site that flowered at the same time, but it had a different color to this preferred species, then it didn't get as many visits from the sunbirds. So um, what seems to be happening here is that um, these less preferred species are mimicking or copying the flower color of the preferred species, which we can call the model. Um, and by doing that, they um, sort of trick the sunbirds into thinking that it's their favorite Erica, and so they get visited as well. We need some uh, more experimental evidence to confirm this theory, but if it holds, then this is quite a, um, a novel mechanism within bird pollination systems. What we suspect is happening here is that orange-breasted sunbirds develop a search image for a certain color and then visit all species with that color. So an erica needs to be the same color as the preferred species at a site in order to get attention from the sunbirds. But that is not the complete story. At some of the sites, we found that the species pairs that occur together have very different colors. For example, in Somerset West, uh, the whitish Erica plucanetti occurred with a pink Erica curviflora. And at Betty's Bay, Pringle Bay, this lime green Erica coccinia occurred with a pink Erica plucanetti. We also measured the flower sizes of these ericas, and in particular the male and female flower parts, which are the anthers and the styles over here, because these flower parts determine where pollen will be picked up by the birds and uh, rubbed off by the birds. Um, and flowers of the same species will have the same flower sizes to ensure that their pollen is mixed well and that they produce nice healthy seeds. But you would expect flowers from different species like this Erica plucanetti and Erica serenthroides here to have different flower sizes because they don't want their pollen to be mixed because that leads to hybridization. However, what we found was that these pairs of ericas with very different flower colors actually had very similar flower sizes. Now, if the flower sizes are the same, then the pollen will be rubbed off and picked up on the same place on a sunbird's bill. For example, if this sunbird visited this red Erica abetina first, it would get pollen on its bill over here. And if it then moves on to visit this Erica plucanetti, the pollen will be rubbed off onto the stigma, the female part, because it is the same length as the anthers of this um, Erica abetina. So this is bad for the plants because it will cause hybridization and unhealthy seeds. So to avoid this hybridization, we suspect that the flowers have evolved different flower colors. Um, when a sunbird is foraging, it may ignore a different color as it is focused on one color only. Sunbirds are thus very important as pollinators um, and play a very important ecological role. And their unique vision and behavior likely helps to maintain this astounding diversity of flowers that we see in the ericas, but not just in the ericas but also in many other plant species. In the Cape Floristic region, there are only about seven nectar drinking specialist bird species. So these include sunbirds and sugarbirds, but there are over 300 plant species that are bird pollinated and therefore depend on these birds for their pollination and seed set and thus their survival. So the conservation of these birds are extremely important. And one easy thing that you can do to help their conservation 
is to plant locally indigenous bird pollinated plants in your gardens and areas. We are spoiled for choice with so many plant, uh, bird pollinated plant species available to us, as you can see from just a few examples that I present here. So how do you know a plant is pollinated by birds? Well, their flowers will typically be large flowers that are mostly tubular shaped and uh, usually bright colors. So I thank you in advance for your contribution to sunbird conservation, and I hope that you enjoy the flowers as well. And lastly, I really just want to thank all the people and organizations and funders that helped to make our research possible. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Anina, for that uh, very interesting talk. Um, so we'll get going with some questions now, if that's okay with you, Anina? Yes, perfect. Yeah, the first question we uh, comes from Eleanor Mary, who is a uh, regular webinar listener, um, and she asks, does the length of the anthers have any preference, have any bearing on the sunbird preferences and ability, ability to reach the nectar and collect pollen? Oh, that's a very interesting question um, because there are some of these ericas that have very long anthers um, that are that stick out of the flower tube. Um, so we don't actually know. That hasn't been tested. Um, and we suspect that the, the length of the anthers um, affect where the pollen is placed on the sunbird's bills. Um, but we don't really know whether they show any preference or dislike in it. We, they do visit all of these ericas um, with all that variety of anthers. So there doesn't seem to be a very strong preference or dislike. Okay. Um, and then um, probably a question that a lot of people would have um, is about feeding uh, sunbirds in their garden and a couple of people have asked whether uh, feeding sunbirds uh, would stop the, the sunbirds from pollinating the fengos or or have any other impact. Right, um, of course. Well, there's not a simple answer um, and we don't really know exactly. Uh, we've only done one experiment so far to um, really objectively test whether the um, sugar water feeders have an effect on these sunbirds. Um, and that suggested that it, it does seem to the, be able to lure the birds from a natural fynbos field to gardens. Um, but I think it depends on the context a lot. And I definitely don't have on all the answers, but I think um, from what I know currently, I would say that the feeders, um, they don't attract the birds um, away from the flowers completely because I myself have, have seen them feeding on feeders and flowers right next to each other. So I, th I think the birds still do go to the flowers. Um, and uh, I think it depends on the scale at which feeders are put out. Um, if there's like really large numbers that are out there very regularly, uh, it's more likely that some birds would become really habituated to using that. Um, uh, over flowers. Um, but I think the place where feeders can probably do the most harm, if it does any harm, is at uh, sites where that are directly adjacent to natural um, habitats like fainbos, um, because they, it's closest to the natural systems where it can affect birds. Um, but gardens, for example, that are very deep in the urban areas and far away from natural sites, probably much less likely affect um, the birds that are in the natural habitats and probably um, it's individuals that are already adapted to that urban environment that's using the feeders there. So yeah, not a simple, simple answer. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, but I think that helps. Um... It's yeah, if I can just you're, add, yeah, go ahead. The, the, the main important thing if people do use feeders is to keep them clean. They should be mm. um, cleaned every day and just to use the right sugar. Just use normal sugar and no um, artificial sugars 
Um, and the colorant is also not necessary. The birds find these feeders very easily without colorant. Um, so it's better to leave that out. Mm. Great, thanks. I'm sure that'll help a lot of people who, who want to, to do the best, <clears throat> to do what's best for the birds. Um, and then uh, Debbie asks that, or oh, says that she's seen um, sunbirds bypass um, the anthers and pollen and go to the nectar at the base or the outside of the flower. So essentially kind of cheating, uh, cheating the system. Yes, um, so that's called nectar robbing. Okay. Um, and that, is, that happens especially with um, sunbirds or birds that uh, visit flowers where the flower tube is too long for them to access it, the, flower, the nectar the right way through the opening of the tube. Um, so they actually have a, a special serration in their bill um, to sort of saw a little hole into the flowers to access the nectar that way. Um, and it's especially the southern double collared sunbirds that have a much shorter bill that tends to do that. Okay. So they're trying to go for something that they didn't, aren't necessarily evolved to, to do. Okay. Yes. Um, and it happens naturally, um, so, but usually it doesn't happen too frequently that the, the um, plants are really affected too badly. If they're normal pollinators like the malachites um, or the sugar birds are around, then there will still be sufficient pollination to keep the plant populations alive. It's usually just in disrupted systems like in urban areas where um, malachites and sugar birds are much more scarce and the southern double collards are very common where that system is so disrupted and it might be that there's only nectar robbing and no pollination happening. So there won't be any seeds in those flowers. Okay. And then Paul asks about the quantity or quality of the nectar and, and what role that plays. Um, in the flowers? Yeah. Yes, a uh, very good question. Um, so definitely the, the birds would aim to go for the most nectar or the nectar that has the most sugar because that's the best value that they get for the effort of going to look for that nectar. Um, and we did actually look at nectar quantities in these ericas, and it does differ between species. Um, but interestingly, the sunbirds didn't always prefer the species that had the best nectar. Um, so we think there's probably a, a combination of factors that determines the sunbirds' preferences, um, like the color, the nectar, um, the number of flowers on a plant, and um, the, the, the height of the plants, which increases their visibility and things like that. Okay. And kind of, I guess, linked to, to that and, and just generally choice of, of flower. Uh, David Allen asks, um, do the sunbirds not also base their choice of flower to visit um, not only on its color, but also according to how close it is to their current position? Um, so optimal foraging theory. Did you take that into account? Yes, yeah, definitely. Good point. I forgot to mention that. Um, but in the experiment that I did, all the flowers were placed equal distances. Um, and we quantified how, the, how far the birds moved um, when they were making their choices. And they definitely uh, uh, mostly go to the flowers that are closest to them. So why waste energy if you can just go to the nearest flower? Um, there's also been some other studies that show that if the sunbirds find a lot of empty flowers, then they're more likely to move a bit further away to seek new nectar. Okay. Um, then uh, uh, Eleanor Mary again asks about um, the different types of plants in, in gardens. So uh, the Leonotus, which is the uh, while Dacher uh, in her Sedgefield garden attracts sunbirds, while aloes and even honeysuckle can bring sunbirds into her garden in Joburg. Uh, can plants that aren't indigenous be good for sunbirds in certain areas? Or is indigenous always best? Um, certainly the birds do visit uh, non-native plant species as well. Um, indigenous is best. Um, 
but not necessarily because of the nectar quality. I don't think there are really big differences in the value of the nectar, um, but the, the local plants are preferred because they are adapted to your specific climate and soil and water, etc. So they're much more um, economic to maintain. Um, the other thing that one must also remember is that the, the birds move pollen around from these flowers that they're visiting. So um, it might be bad for the local plants um, to get this mixture of pollen from non-native species. Um, but yeah, definitely non-native plants also visited by the sunbirds. And I think it's going to depend on which species have the best nectar or the most flowers. Uh, whether the birds choose native or non-native and whether they can access the flowers. I mean the nectar because of how the flower is structured. Okay. And then um, is there any information on the, the nectar, so, sorry this question is from Lorraine, um, on the nectar production um, of the, the model and the mimic species, whether that differs in any way uh, in the nectar production. Mm. Um, so there are, there were differences. Um, so we measured the concentration of the nectar and their volume. Um, but the model species wasn't always the one with the best nectar, the most, um, the most or the most concentrated nectar. Um, so, and, and we didn't, we just measured um, standing crop, which is the nectar uh, produced by uh, um, by flowers and we didn't measure like how the nectar might change over a day or over a couple of days so that might uh, differ between these species so that could definitely be something that influences the birds choices. Okay um, yeah there was a, a question from Rian about about that about the different where the sunbirds feed on on flowers at different times of the day and whether there's sugar differences in sugar content in different times of day, but you say that was not something that you looked at. Um, I looked at it in Erica Perspicua um, at that one population. Um, and the nectar generally seems to accumulate, but it's usually highest in the morning because um, the nectar is produced overnight and no birds feed on it. And then in the morning the birds are most active and they feed um, during the morning a lot and then um, usually nectar is depleted by late morning um, and then the flowers can replenish that or new flowers open up during the day and then at the end of the day there's usually a lot of flowers again with lots of nectar and the, fee the, the birds then feed very uh, a lot at the end of the day just before they um, settle down for the night again. So that's the most common pattern in the bird pollinated flowers in general. Okay, uh, and then a couple of people have asked about your your research paper and, and whether it's available online. So maybe you can just tell us the name of your paper and and I um, and people can search for it. Uh, sure. Um, uh, it's probably the paper on uh, mimicry that they're talking about. I don't, it's not open access, unfortunately, so you need to access it through a university. Um, but people can also email me and I will just pass it on to them. Great. Um, it's in evolutionary ecology and it's about um, the, how mimicry or facilitation and competition shapes this geographical mosaic in Erika's. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, Pamela asks about the, the proteas, um, not necessarily the topic of your uh, study that you presented on this evening, but um, can you explain where the nectar is held in proteas and, and how the birds access it and, um, and whether and how some birds can access it or not? Uh, yeah, so proteas are really cool. It's actually um, what looks like a flower is a collection of a lot of small flowers inside there. So it's actually an inflorescence. And each of those, uh, these, those little stalks that you see sticking out is one flower. So that's uh, the case for proteas and the pincushions and even the pagoda bushes. Um, and that flower has a short tube at the bottom where the nectar is produced um, and it builds up there. 
And in many of the proteas, especially the ones that are quite closed off, that are not a very open cup shape, they can hold the nectar in that bigger flower bowl, if you like, so the nectar can build up in there. Um, so the, the sugar birds who typically sit on top of this protea and probe inside for the nectar, um, but the sunbirds, of course, have a much shorter bill, so they will go in through the side um, and put their bill in through those um, leaves that are protecting the, the flowers, and they would basically steal the, the nectar from there because they won't pollinate the flowers effectively then. Um, so that's def definitely something that the, the sunbirds do. Okay, great. Uh, and then Andrew asks, has there been any research on the olfactory senses in sunbirds? Um, does that play a role at all, or is it mostly visual? Um, good question. Um, you should. Um, so the in general, birds' um, sense uh, sense of smell is not very well developed. So they use their uh, vision and their hearing mostly. Um, and because they don't use their smell very much, flowers that are pollinated by sunbirds haven't evolved a strong scent um, because it's not worth the energetic effort of uh, producing those molecules that produce a scent to attract the sunbirds because they mostly just use their vision. Um, so that's a really interesting difference between bird pollinated plants and uh, insect pollinated plants because the bird pollinated plants don't have a scent generally. Um, but yeah, that's a whole research field on its own. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so then uh, I think this question comes from Matt. Um, are there any birds with uh, that don't see any color um, do you, that you know of? And, and would this be associated with, you know, night birds or night blindness? Um, so as I don't know. Uh, I might, there might be some that I don't know of, but as far as I know, all birds can see color. Um, the nocturnal birds, the night living birds, they have more of the specific pigments in their eyes that um, help them to distinguish um, darker and lighter colors under low light conditions. So they have less of those pigments that pick up color. Um, so their color vision is not as good, but they have these other pigments that help them to see better in low light. Um, but as far as I know, they can all distinguish colors, definitely more than we can. Yeah, yeah, it would be really interesting to be able to see what a, what a bird sees. Exactly. Um, and then Mervyn asks or says that they have uh, Tecomeria capensis, which is Cape honeysuckle. In, our, in their garden, which has varying colors from yellow to bright red. And they've noticed that the yellow flowers don't attract the local sunbirds in KZN. Um, do you know any reasons for that? They say, is it, is it the color or um, is it the nectar quantity? So I can't remember the details, but I know there are some, there are three color forms in the uh, Cape Honeysuckle and one of them is natural and the others have been bred by humans through selective, you know, artificial selection. Um, and if I think it's the orange one that's the natural color. Um, so it might be that the sunbirds don't recognize the new forms that, that we have bred um, because they don't recognize that color together with that shape as a, a source uh, because they haven't evolved with it or, uh, through the artificial breeding of the, the flowers, there might have been changes in the nectar that makes them less preferred by the birds. That's my guess. Okay. Um, we're almost at eight o'clock, so we'll just do maybe two more questions. Um, <clears throat> the one from uh, Machtelt is, um, if the sunbirds prefer the, the pink flowers, uh, what does that like? What does that then mean for the persistence of the the white flowers? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So that's a really interesting conundrum that we don't really understand. Uh, we think that it's uh, there's probably a, a process that involves the abundances of the flowers that the birds might prefer one color. Um, 
and until it's favored uh, and until there's lots of it. Um, but if there's for some reason more abund higher abundance of the other color, then they start favoring that color again. And so over, for a couple of generations, that color would be, uh, you know, would increase in abundance. So we suspect that the dynamics of the abundances probably help to maintain these different color forms. Um, and remember that the Fainbos is a fire dynamic system as well. So it burns regularly and that clears all the plants and then they need to regrow again. And often the communities of, of ericas are different after fires, depending on which uh, seeds were dispersed or survived during the fires. So the, the, this dynamic Fainbos system probably also helps to, to maintain all the different varieties. Hmm. So, so on that note, with um, Fainbos being fire dominated, um, do you? It's something that I've I've often wondered is um, when after there has been a fire and it takes a little while for the plant community to become established enough to have nectar bearing flowers. Do you know what the sunbirds do at at that stage? Um, that's one of the lovely mysteries of sunbirds. <laughs> we don't re always know what they do. They seem to just vanish sometimes and we don't know where they may move to. Uh, they probably do move to some safe places where there are still um, sufficient plants for them. Certainly people have reported sunbirds um, and sugarbirds moving to urban areas after big fires because there just isn't any refuge or food for them around. Um, I think they, they just move around to unburnt patches. The problem that we have nowadays is that the natural habitat is so fragmented that they sometimes don't have that, um, uh, what's the word, opportunity or option of moving to another mountain range because there's uh, an agricultural field or an urban area between them. Um, so that's, that's definitely something that probably affects them. And when fires are small, it's okay because um, there's still options, but when we have these very big extensive fires, then they are probably affected a lot more. Um, mm. So yeah. Okay, so it's important for people living on the edge of the Fainbos to, to plant indigenous gardens to, yeah. to help them out. Great, yeah. well I think, I think we'll leave it there for the questions. Thank you very much. Um, I, I certainly enjoyed the talk and, and if you look in the chat you'll see that um, the audience did as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, yes, I, did forget, I did forget to remind uh, everyone to please participate in the post webinar survey, which will pop up when you exit the webinar. Um, for those who attended last week, you'll notice that it is uh, the same survey as last week, because last week I was trying to be efficient uh, by doing two putting in, in two surveys at the same time, but I got the links mixed up. So apologies for that, but please do complete the survey. Um, and uh, yeah, please do join us next week for our conservation conversations, where we will be hosting um, the two uh, winning student presenters from the recent Learn About Birds conference. So it'll be a talk on raptors and DDT, and um, as well as the diet of seabirds and how that changes with warming temperatures. So yeah, on that note, uh, Anina, I don't know if you want to say any closing words. Uh, just thank you for the opportunity. It was great to be here. Thanks, and thanks very much for joining us. That was uh, very enjoyable. So thank you very much to all our listeners and, and viewers. Uh, thanks for joining us for another uh, Conservation Conversations. And uh, please do join us next week. And in the meantime, please do stay safe, look after yourselves and uh, keep looking out for those birds. Good night. <laughs>